How could I have been together with a thin-haired woman like you for 35 years? All my retirement money is mine. You with your thin hair are neither my wife nor a woman. My husband, who's been with me for 35 years, scoffs at my thinning hair. Why did my husband suddenly start to ridicule my thinning hair when he reached retirement age? I know all the reasons why. Okay, I got it. Here you are, the divorce papers. I don't think my husband expected me to sign the papers as he wished. He was wide-eyed, open-mouthed, and speechless. My name is Daisy, 67 years old. From the time I was in my 20s until I retired, I worked as a nurse at a general hospital. I retired at the age of 65, and it's been two years since I retired. Now I work part-time at a nursing home. My husband Donald is 64 years old, three years younger than me. He is on his way to work today, just before his retirement. Donald and I got married 35 years ago. I was 32 at the time. I was working in a hospital, mainly for the night staff. Then my father, who was the manager of the medical equipment manufacturer, came to me. Daisy, why don't you think about getting married? You shouldn't only be passionate about your work, but you should also find happiness as a woman. He arranged me to meet Donald. My father's company dealt with medical devices such as thermometers, blood pressure cuffs, and cardiac pacemakers. When my father became elderly, my brother took over my father's company. The company's management and sales are still going strong. When my father was in charge, Donald was the son of the managing director. Donald was neither handsome nor tall, nor does he have any outstanding skills. My first impression of him was that he was a serious gentleman. At the time, I was on a blind date and thought this man was going to be my husband, but it didn't really feel like it. Why did Donald seem to be so serious on the blind date? The reason is, it's not an exaggeration to say that it was an arranged marriage because of our parents' circumstances. This is what I was told after the blind date but his father was like my father's lackey the whole time he was on the job. Please, let my son be a potential husband of your daughter and please, arrange a blind date. They're so close in age. I think the two of them will get along very well. My father-in-law heard a rumor that my father was looking for a future husband for me. I heard that he suggested to my father that I have a blind date with Donald. My father was not surprised and readily agreed. At the blind date, I just greeted like, nice to meet you, I'm Daisy. I only remember that I gave a minimal greeting. The fathers of both families proceeded to talk to each other and Donald asked me at the end of the blind date, I would like very much to see you again. I vividly remember that. But now, 35 years after marrying, I've almost forgotten about the rest of our relationship. My father used to ask me, how are things going with you and Donald these days? And my mother asked me, Why don't you wear that on your next date? It would be fashionable, wouldn't it? She bought me a lot of new clothes. I can still vaguely remember that. My parents arranged my relationship and marriage with Donald, but after the marriage, many hardships followed. As soon as we were married, my husband, who was in the best of spirits and as soon as we got married, my husband, who was in the best spirits, said, I am deeply grateful to Jasper and Eva for giving me this opportunity to meet Daisy. And then he continued, As my father said, I would like to live with you both after our marriage. I would like to repay the two of you for giving me this wonderful opportunity to meet Daisy. And then he simply decided to move in at my parents' house. What? Are you sure? I was surprised, but my husband said, I'm indebted to both of them. He smiled and said, it's only natural. I wondered if he feels that my marriage is just a tool for his connection. I couldn't believe how easily he accepted to live with my parents. We started our honeymoon with a slight sense of bewilderment. My husband went to work as a regular employee of my father's company. After work, he comes home to my parents' house with my father, but that kind of life didn't last long. Jasper complained that I don't do my work well. 
I'm just doing business as usual. Since Donald married Daisy, I'm getting an extreme increase in customer complaints. I've heard wrong dates for business meetings and miswritten documents. And there was one time he didn't pass on a call from a non-client to the employee in charge. I can't help but think that you're on a roll now that you're married to Daisy. At home, my husband and father each complained about each other. But between them, my mother and I are just baffled. After a few months of this, my husband quarreled with my father and resigned from his company. I'm sick and tired of seeing your father's face at home and at work. From now on, I'm going to be a stay-at-home dad. Not work, just take care of the house. Sorry, but don't just make an important decision without consulting me. Besides, if you and your father don't get along, you don't have to live with him. My husband's sudden resignation made me flinch. Then he continues. I'm sure you'll be fine with me being a stay-at-home dad. I'm tired of working and being at home with your stubborn father. I'm really mentally tired now. My husband found a cheap apartment to rent and right after that we started living together. If this was going to happen, I wish he never announced that he was going to live with my parents in the first place. I murmured my dissatisfaction with him in my mind, but I never actually said anything to him. A few years later, our daughter was born and he started looking for a job. But each time he found a new job, he would quit. Then he found another one and then another one. Eventually, he started working part-time as a security guard and a janitor. I tried my best to balance the night shifts and work in raising our child. Then, when I was 40, my mother died of lung cancer. And, when I was 55 years old, my father suffered a stroke and passed away. My daughter was just 20 years old when I saw them both off to heaven. After raising children and taking care of my parents, I wanted to devote myself to my work and hobbies. That's what I wanted. But life doesn't always work out the way you want it to. My husband, who had been working part-time jobs for the past few years, he was hired as a full-time employee by a security company, which was one of his part-time jobs. Of course, that itself is a happy occasion. But in reality, it was not a cause for celebration. It was a sighing situation. As soon as my husband started working full-time, he started spending money wildly. New cars, golf clubs, fishing equipment, and other expensive hobbies. What is this new car? You have a license, but you don't drive, right? I was astonished. My husband said to me as if he was looking down on me. I'm the head of the house. I work hard every day as a full-time employee. What I buy with my own money is my business. With these words, I understood everything that was going on with him. My parents are dead, our child is a grown-up, and my husband finally got a full-time job. He thinks now he is free to spend money on expensive hobbies. Maybe I put up with him and a lot of burdens without realizing it. When we got married, he asked to live with my parents, but just because he wanted to be a nice husband. Both during work and during his private life, he's being forced to be with my father, whom he didn't get along with. He was mentally exhausted and could not get a regular job for many years. When I think about it, I can't say anything back to my husband. But he took advantage of the fact that I didn't say anything back to him. My husband took it even farther. Your hair is getting thinner these days, isn't it? I've been thinking for a while. Why don't, why don't you buy some of those hair growth pills? If you don't, you'll be mistaken for an old man on the streets or at work. My husband started making fun of my thinning hair. I'm not concerned about it myself, leave me alone. When I'd say that back to him, he'd say, You just don't leave it like that, it's why it's getting worse. You're a woman, you should take better care of yourself. Buy some hair growth pills or go see a doctor. I don't like it when you lax or even one of your flaws like that. That's when my husband's long talk begins. I started noticing thinning hair in my mid-thirties, and by the time I was in my fifties it had become quite noticeable. But my husband had never complained about my thinning hair, rather it's more like my husband didn't even come home as much. We moved out of my parents' house 
and we started living in a rented apartment. Sometimes my parents would come to visit us because they were worried about me. My husband felt awkward, so he took a night job as a security guard, and during the day he would take naps at an internet cafe and never come home. After my parents passed away, he got a full-time job at a security company and started coming home early. And every time he saw me, he started complaining about my thinning hair. This situation continues to this day. He married me through an arranged marriage, and my father and he didn't even get along. And because of that, he had to resign from his job. After that, he couldn't find a job and would constantly work part-time. When he sees my face, I think he gets irritated because he remembers his bad past. Just as I was thinking about that my husband started making fun of my thinning hair, I found out the real reason through my daughter. Mom, I saw that walking with a woman happily on the streets. My husband was having an affair with a woman. I asked a credit agency to investigate it. The result was as I expected. I had all the evidence I needed to prove that my husband was cheating on me. But the most unforgivable thing was the fact that my daughter witnessed my husband's affair. No matter how bad our marriage life was, he shouldn't allow his child to see him cheating. My mind was made up. Divorce was the only option. Then the question was, when should I ask my husband for divorce? When it comes down to it, I didn't know when to tell him or how to start the conversation. Then I thought to myself, today is going to be the day I ask my husband for a divorce. On the day I made up my mind to do so, to my surprise, my husband divorced me first. How could I have been 35 years together with a thin-haired woman like you? All my retirement money is mine. You with your thinning hair are neither my wife nor a woman. Now that I'm retired, I hope to spend the rest of my life without seeing your disgusting head. As usual, my husband scoffed at my thinning hair. He put out the divorce papers on the table. It was the day after his retirement, but I didn't count on his retirement money. He worked for the security company for about 10 years from his 50s until now. He will probably receive about a million dollars at most in retirement benefits. I don't need this. I shoved back the divorce papers that my husband had presented me. What? It's pointless to come back at me now, okay? I've already made up my mind. Yes, I've made up my mind too. Here are the divorce papers. In exchange for the blank divorce papers my husband had given me, I handed the completed ones I'd already prepared. I don't think he expected me to hand them the completed divorce papers. His eyes widened, his mouth dropped open, and he was speechless. Hey, are you trying to say that your husband has no good use to you now that he's retired? You've come up with big now that I'm getting retirement payout. My husband complained about it like he sounded like he had hardly tried to speak. I can't help but just let out a sigh. How much do you think you'll get in severance pay? You've been a full-time employee for that security company for about 10 years. It's about a million dollars anyway, right? You're just trying to get me to leave you because my severance pay is so low. You only saw me as a man who brings him money, didn't you? In front of the red-faced, angry husband, I held out a single brown envelope. I decided to divorce you because every time I saw you at home, you would make fun of my thinning hair. And because of what I found in this envelope. What? He froze for a moment. The next moment, he snatches the envelope from my hand. He looked at the photos in the envelope and hastily hid them behind his back. This is, you know, just for fun. My husband shouted out loud and then suddenly said, You could have been mistaken for an old man with thinning hair. I get depressed when I'm with you because you don't even try to take care of yourself. My life is so boring. I'd like to have a taste of the surreal for once in a while. My husband wants to blame me for cheating on me. I can't admit that. If you don't like me, you can leave me. I can't forgive that our daughter witnessed your cheating scene. How can you flirt with a woman who you cheated on your wife with in broad daylight at a public place? Our daughter would have a boyfriend too. She doesn't care about the, such trivial things like this. My husband showed no signs of remorse. Well, let's talk about it through a lawyer. Then I left the house. Later, I received a phone call from my ex-husband who 
Must have seen the alimony notice you received from my lawyer. I, I miss you when I'm home alone. I I'm sorry, but let's remarry. I'm speechless with dismay at my ex-husband asking me to remarry him as soon as he calls me. Oh, why don't you remarry her? No, I mean, she said she was just playing with me. She told me not to pester her because I broke up with you. She even called me a stalker. You're all I've got. No, you don't have anything to say. I'm going to hang up on you. I'll even block your calls. I told him that and he got all flustered. Wait a minute. Listen, what, why don't we go shopping together? We can go to a cafe or a restaurant or something? Oh, you're buying me a drink? I ask. Um, that is, he stopped talking. You're probably full of money from your hefty alimony payment to me. You don't have any money, do you? My ex-husband suddenly became very angry and raised his voice. That's right. I had to borrow money because of your demand for alimony. Just because I cheated on you for a little while? I don't think the alimony is worth $3,200,000. Don't you know? The marriage is long and the relationship is bad. And if all of the mental damage is too great to infidelity, alimony could be that much. My ex-husband was shocked to hear that. Then I heard someone's voice behind him. It's a lone shark. I'll hang up the phone. He quickly hung up on me, so I blocked his number. Later, my ex-husband called my daughter. He said he was lonely and wanted me to take care of him. He was so persistent that I blocked the calls. That's what my daughter told me. I'm sorry for bothering you. I apologized to her and she said, It's not your fault, it's all his fault. She smiles at me. He didn't get along with you, Mom, and Grandpa. He didn't come home as often as he should have. I don't even consider him my father, so don't worry about it. My daughter encouraged me by saying so. My ex-husband got blocked by me and my daughter. He blurted out to everyone that he was lonely. One day, I went to inspect the car. The dealer who was involved with purchasing my ex-husband's new car said that my ex-husband, that he had a small rental apartment that it feels bigger without my family. My ex-husband, now retired, can't seem to find a new job, and his debts seem to be increasing. He moved out of the apartment he was renting. He can't pay his cell phone bill, and his cell phone bill is out of service. He has been living in his car with the little money he has left, and he's in huge debt. He is also on the run from loan sharks. We have no way of knowing where he is now. Then we got some good news. My daughter is getting married to a man she met at nursing school where she did our internship. Of course, we didn't send an invitation to my ex-husband. He is missing and my daughter doesn't want him to attend. The day before my wedding, my ex-husband called her from a payphone. Before she could say no, he was forced to hang up due to lack of money. As for me, I'm living with my daughter and her husband while continuing to work as a nurse at a nursing home. The family home that my late parents left to me was vacant for a long time. They renovated it and turned it into a beautiful two-family house. My son-in-law is a really nice person. He takes good care of me as well as my daughter. He suggested that we live in a two-family house because he thought my daughter would be worried if I lived alone. When I went shopping with my daughter and son-in-law, he'd casually ask to carry my things. But it could just be because my son-in-law is in high spirits. After all, he's a newlywed. I made the mistake of believing in my husband's kindness when he was married to me. That's why in order to prevent my daughter and son-in-law from repeating the mistakes I made, I wanted to have a relationship in which each of them can live freely and comfortably. Mom, this is the one I chose with him. Thank you for everything you've done. I hope you can enjoy your life from now on. With that said, the gift my daughter gave me before the wedding was a bright orange hat. My husband makes fun of me, who lives as a housewife, and of my family who live in the countryside. My name is Sarah. I'm 27 years old and a homemaker. My husband James is 3 years older than me, 30, and a banker. 
My parents own a construction company, and my parents are still working. James is a graduate of a prestigious university, and is just so proud. He talks about my father, who started his own company with a middle school diploma, and then makes fun of him. He always looks down on me because of it. James and I met at the party. I was a fashion model for a magazine when I was in college. Because of this, I was often invited to parties, and I liked to attend them. Some celebrities came to these parties too. I met a lot of people, but all of them were just for that short moment. When I was fed up with such routine, I met James. James doesn't drink. He wasn't into it so much so that it was easy to tell that someone from the company had brought him along. His lack of fashionable look made him stand out in New York. I was curious about James, so we exchanged contact information. James was a little shaky, perhaps because he was nervous, but I liked it. While keeping in touch with James, I remained the same and joined the parties. New York was exciting and very attractive. I even had a part time job. Where I get paid just by attending parties and drinking together. Looking back, I'm ashamed to have done those things. Then something unexpected happened. At the time, I was in a relationship with my boyfriend. Nevertheless, I was doing what I wanted, and so did he. I really liked him, and still thought we were getting along well. One day, He told me that he was going to get married. This was the first time I found out that he had a fiance. He was not serious about me. I had mistaken his feelings back then. I thought that men pampered me because they liked me. But I was wrong. The only reason they pamper you is that they want to drink in a good mood and feel good. I was not the only one who thought I was doing well to adapt to a city full of lies. I decided to get a serious job after college, but I was already paying the price for my college years of playing around. My grades were not good at all, and I could not get a job at the company I wanted. So I thought about going back to the countryside. But I didn't want to go back to a town with a chorus of frogs leaving the glamour city. I lied to my parents and said I would stay in New York a little longer because I was about to get a job. My parents were concerned, but it's your life. You are responsible for it. And they let me be free. But once I had enjoyed earning money easily, it was hard for me to lower my standard of living. For a while, I took a part time job. Of course, That's not enough to make a living. I found myself soon resuming attending parties and drinking. It was then that I met James again. That day, I was at the bank job hunting. It was my 10th company this month, and I was about to lose my senses. So I met James again as an interviewer. James didn't seem to notice me there, so I didn't speak to him. But that night, James contacted me and we decided to go out for a drink together. James told me, Unless you stop drinking and go to parties, you will never get a decent, honest job. It may be annoying, but people can tell right away that you have that kind of aura about you. I was shocked when he said that. It was oddly persuasive coming from James, a job interviewer. After that, I started contacting James every day. I realized that I had stopped drinking and attending parties. Then, James confessed to me, and we started dating. I didn't have a steady job, but I was busy working part time. I was job hunting to get a full time job, but James stopped me from doing that. If you marry me, why don't you become a housewife? You don't have to worry about money. I would be happy if you did the house chores. Why don't you take a cooking class? I thought I was a total winner and felt like everything was going so well. I mistakenly thought 
that I could win even if I didn't have a job thanks to my looks after all. I was completely on a roll at the time. As James said, I went to cooking classes and improved myself. Then James told me I was cute and cherished me every day. My friends around me were envious of me, and I felt like I had somehow won for life. Then he proposed to me, which I had been waiting for, and we soon moved in together. James had a pretty good rent allowance from his company, so we lived in a beautiful apartment. I started living there too, and every day was sparkling. When I told my family about it, they were very happy, and I was glad I didn't have to go back to the countryside back then. Then, we greeted both our families to get married. Coming to my hometown, James, who grew up in the city, just laughed. Who lives in a place like this? I felt kind of foolish, but I laughed at the moment too. My parents own a construction company, so they have a lot of heavy machinery. James had taken a picture of them with his phone camera and put it up on social media. And his caption was also somehow as if he made fun of it. I got angry about it. And James said, It's not about mouthing. It's just that you're taking it in a distorted way. And then he said, I didn't think that a New York girl grew up in the countryside like that. And then, he continued to take pictures of the countryside. I started to wonder if this was the right marriage. Later that day, I went to meet James' family. They snickered when they heard about my college and my parents' occupation. I can't help it. Outside work is for people who aren't good at studying. You must have the strongest luck to marry James even though you have no skills. Well, there is a saying that luck is part of the ability, but don't drag James down too much. That's what my mother-in-law said. I was stunned because I did not expect to be treated like that. I was getting more and more anxious about our marriage. But it's crazy to hesitate now. I don't have a job and I can definitely make a reasonable living with James. So I told myself that this was fine. We didn't have a wedding ceremony. The reason was that our families were totally different, and I wanted to avoid having all of them in one location. Even when we met face to face once, I felt that his family somehow made fun of my parents, so I apologized to my parents. They are right, so it doesn't matter, and I'm used to it because I often encounter such senses doing this job. I felt sorry for my father who laughed and said that. I really respect my father for making this company so big, even though he is the first generation. He never blames me for my inadequacies. If you have any problems, you can always come back to me. I would be very happy to have an office worker, and I'm happy to work with Sarah. He always welcomed me and respected my decisions, even if my future husband is rude. As long as you are happy, that's fine of course, so don't care what they say. But if he says anything to hurt you, I will get angry. That's all he said. I couldn't achieve anything, even though he looked such good care of me. I couldn't tell my parents that I had been drinking and attending parties and earning money by doing that. I vowed at that moment to live my life in a way that I could be proud of myself from now on. James and I then got registered and became husband and wife. Every day, I made James lunch, did the house chores, and waited for him to come home. I was a nobody, trying to be the best wife I could be for James. But James changed after we got married. James didn't like anything I did. He would say, that's why people with different backgrounds hear different values. He also took his work stress out of me more and more. And the hardest thing of all was that we couldn't have children. We wanted to have children as soon as we got married. But we couldn't have children as we had hoped. 
We went to the clinic to run some tests, but we couldn't find any problem, so we continued doing our best. Six months after we got married, we quarreled over a trivial matter. I will never forget what James said to me at that time. I was so unlucky by getting a wife who can't have kids, can't work, and isn't productive. I can live without you without a problem. But then, you would get some support from the state, wouldn't you? You are a hundred years too young to talk big to me. That's what he said. This is definitely moral harassment. Whether I was angry or crying, James' rage echoed through the room. I still put up with the thought that I must be getting punished for my past behavior. Then, a good story came to me. My father told me that there was a nice property in my city. He said that a friend of his was going to be transferred, so he wanted to sell his house. When I told James about it, he wasn't too keen on the idea, but we agreed to go and have a look at it. The house is close to James' office, and my father's friend is willing to sell it to me for half the market price. However, my father had already bought the house. If we don't move in, the house will be the second house of my parents. And he told me, I would be grateful if you would live in the house. A house deteriorates if someone doesn't live in it. You don't need to pay the rent, so why don't you move in? I know you will need money in the future, so I think it would be good to save it now. I soon suggested that to James. I've never lived in a dirty house, so I can only tell you after we had a look into it. And besides, I don't want to owe your parents. I thought, well, that's fine then. I would be more upset if even after moving in, he stays arrogant as he is. I decided to ask my father for the key number, and we took a look together. It is a newer and more stylish house than I had imagined. I was impressed by its luxurious appearance as well as its surroundings. James was also excited. After all, this is an upscale residential area. James, who has a lot of pride, was very satisfied with the location and the appearance of the house. When we went inside, we were not disappointed. The house is about twice the size of our current house. We were planning to move when we have kids, so it's a little early, but it's ideal. James got excited. Sarah, your dad did a great job. I was wondering what kind of house he was going to show us, because he is so rustic. But it's much better than I thought it was going to be. He said, I want to live here. I agreed but I wanted to pay my father a little rent. I felt too bad to let us live here for free. I told my father that. It's totally fine for you to live here for free. I mean, the house, in my opinion, is not very resistant to rain. I only bought it because I could afford it for the price of the land, so don't worry about it. But I think you should just rebuild the house eventually. He says it's free of charge. When I told James about it, he said, Your dad doesn't understand the value of money. That's great. I hate ignorant people, but it turns out to be a good thing. I've learned a lot from your father. I was angry at his attitude, but I've never won at Crawlow against him. I know that in the end, I will be talked over in different terms and James gets what he wants. Eventually, I thanked my father and we moved in. However, living in a detached house can be a hassle. Community rules, garbage duties, and board members' event have added an unprecedented burden to my life. Since I'm a homemaker, I was the one who did the jobs and attended all the events. James seems busy, and I felt I had no choice. James was generally off on weekends. When we first got married, we would have lunch together at a fancy restaurant on our days off. But since about six months ago, 
He seems to be a different person. He started going to work on his days off more often and coming home late. He was never interested in fashion, but now he is addicted to online shopping. He has his phone in his hands all day, and it's weird to see him grinning at the phone. I found it suspicious, but I didn't feel like asking him about that. It doesn't sadden me if James was cheating on me. However, if he did, I was going to make sure he was brought to justice accordingly. Then, just as I had expected, the incident happened. To my surprise, the adulterer stormed into my house. It was a Sunday morning. James was all on his phone that day. Normally, his phone never rang, but today, his phone rang. You're getting a call. Shouldn't you answer it? It's okay. It's a work call anyway. I've decided to not to answer the phone today because it's my day off. About an hour after the call, the intercom rang. I looked at the monitor and saw a woman I had never seen before. I asked, "May I ask who you are?" "I'm James Colley. I'm having trouble reaching James. Is James there?" She talked to me in a very unfriendly manner. My female intuition said that this woman is James' lover. James paled at the sound of adulterous voice echoing through the house. There was no doubt. I also got nervous. James carried me out of the house and closed the front door so that I could not hear their conversation. But that idea was naive. I turned on the microphone on the intercom monitor. I can hear their conversation clearly. It's not right to come over to my house. You know my position. I don't reply to you because of this kind of rushed behavior of you. When he said that, the adulterous woman said, "I've put up with it all this time too. Do you understand how I feel? Even if I get fired from the company." I'm fine as long as I can be with you, James. She's crying. I felt like I was watching some cheap late-night drama series. The script seems so easily predictable that even I might be able to write. I thought they were going to hug each other and make up anyway, and that's exactly what happened. I was left with nothing but regret that I had wasted my time on something so uninteresting. I quickly turned off the monitor and pretended I didn't hear anything. When James came into the house, it was a sight to see what his excuse would be. About five minutes later, James returned as if nothing has happened. An employee who lives near here delivers the materials to me, and shows me the envelope. I responded appropriately and decided to let him fool me for the day. The next day, I finished my chores and started my important work. When it comes to cheating investigations, you should go to the credit agency. But I didn't want to spend money on this nonsense. I started playing detective by myself. I slipped a GPS into James' cover, and I started watching him all the time. On the third day after I started it, there was an immediate movement. After work, he headed in a different direction from our house. I followed him. He went into the house of the woman he was having an affair with, and he didn't come out for about four hours. He told me he was working late, so I'm pretty sure he was having an affair. I caught the two of them on camera getting along. I also made sure to check James' messages on my computer, which tell he is going to be late. It was so easy to capture them together, which made me sincerely glad I didn't hire an agency. The material is so well done that it is hard to believe that I have been playing detective for a week. I was even about to start to think I had been a detective in a previous life, and that night I questioned James. James, there is something you are keeping from me, isn't there? I think it's time to settle that story now. But he changed his face to a serious one, 
as if he could sense my determination. What's your point? What's wrong with you? You are living a stress-free life where you don't have to work. There is nothing more luxurious than that. I think you should turn a blind eye. He doesn't seem to feel sorry at all. I'm fully prepared for that. I don't have any feelings left for James. That's why I said it clearly. That's called moral harassment. I don't work outside the home, and I don't get paid, but I have taken care of you perfectly. So I can't forgive you, and I don't think I can be with you anymore. That said, James started to laugh. You've just saved me a lot of trouble. You're getting all old. Just divorce me. You're not worthy to be fed by me. There is zero good in it for you. I knew he was probably saying something I should be upset about, but I'm not getting any of the content. I feel like I'm listening to music from some strange country. I laid out all the signs of infidelity I've ever collected on the table in front of him. James looks at it and sneakers. You really have nothing to do, don't you? Forget it. The time I spent talking to you is just a waste. So get your divorce papers or whatever you are going to do and get it over with. If you are really okay with that. I handed him the filled out divorce papers. Yeah, okay. Here you go. Divorce papers. I want it done by the end of the week. So write them down quickly. And this house is my father's. So you have to leave. As I said that. His expression stiffened and changed. Wait, I will take this house. I have told the company that I own this place, so it will be hard to take that back. I will buy it from you at a discount, so you get out. That's impossible. He dares to ask for the house after being taken care of by me and my father so much more. No, no, no. It's not a question of taking it or giving it away. A house is something that originally belonged to the owner. I don't know if you were trying to look good, but you can't do that, so you should give up. Tell the company that you lied to them. When I tell him, he got angry and explode. He was throwing things and breaking things, and I felt like he was going to kill me. I left the house and called my father. I told him everything, and he got angry. I went back to my parents' house and told James that I was divorcing him. James agreed to the divorce, and it was decided that we would file for divorce on Sunday. Then my father told me, It's a good opportunity. I've rented a storage unit nearby, and we can move James' stuff out there. And we can let everything there that we don't need. So let's clean up and clear out. That's what he said. I didn't get his words, but I took my stuff out as my father instructed. James seems to come home from time to time to get his stuff, but he seems to be rolling into the woman's apartment. I had something I wanted to be done by Sunday. That is to inform the company of the affair. It's not a sweet world where there are no functions. The young woman also needs to be punished for her behavior. I sent the proof of the affair to the company. The next day, I received several calls from James. He must have received the proof of the affair. I'm just telling them what happened. I don't have time to talk to you. We don't need to understand each other anymore, so I won't even try. Let's file the divorce papers on time, and let's both be free. That's all I texted him. The divorce papers were filed on time. I consulted with the lawyer my father introduced me to about alimony and made sure they both paid it. And on this day, my father did the most refreshing thing. My father said he didn't want a house with that kind of seismic insecurity, so he demolished it. James who didn't know that, was surprised when he came to pick up his stuff the next day. I just left the key to the rental storage in the small mailbox. The woman was left to pay the price for her infidelity. 
She had worked at the headquarters of a major bank, but was now working in a regional office. James couldn't even get transferred, so he became a copy boy. James, full of pride, left the company immediately. And even if he looked for another company, it was hard to find a job in this time of recession. The alimony he had paid me had wiped out his savings, and he was now living in poverty. He and his lover broke up immediately since then. I heard a rumor that he is now living in a shabby apartment and doing some part time jobs. He made fun of other people for his entire life. Now it's his turn to be ridiculed, and he deserves it. As for me, I went back to my parents' house and started working as an office worker in the family business. The glitter of the city is nice, but I feel at home in the countryside. My friends live their own suitable lives, and I again realize how foolish I was in the past. From now on, I would like to improve myself by being surrounded by good air and kind people. My husband thought the video call ended and invited his mistress into his bedroom when all his family saw it. Dad! Dad! Hey, how are you guys? The kids looked forward to weekly video calls with their father who was living abroad. I thought that after his tenure was over, we could live happily together again as a family of four. But, my name is Michelle. I got married to my husband, Ian, whom I had been dating since high school right after university. It was our first love and had a whirlwind romance, like in movies. Our marriage was smooth sailing for five years. We were blessed with two children. His work was going well and was working abroad on a project by himself. Raising two boys alone was a challenge, but being a full time housewife with the help of my parents, I was getting by. It was a weekly video call with Ian that night. The kids were excited to be able to talk with him. By the scheduled time, I, the kids, and even my parents gathered in front of the computer. It was like a big family event. To be honest, I was longing to speak to him alone about my struggles and our future plans, which I couldn't let the kids hear. Hoping I would have a chance, I prepared my computer in front of my family in the living room. Hey, how are you kids? Have you been good boys? Ian smiled broadly when he saw their happy faces. He seemed to be well and looked the same as ever. The kids were busy talking non stop about what they'd done and asked him when he would be back. My parents also enjoyed watching their bubbly conversations. I guess that was what it meant to have smooth sailing and be happy. After the Q&A session was over, the kids were exhausted. That was just as well. Ian lived in a country where there was a 12 hour time difference. They were normally in bed by that time, but for that specific occasion, they took a nap during the day to stay up. We'll put the kids to bed. You guys can talk in private if you like. My parents were considerate and left the living room with them. I appreciated them for doing more than I could expect. We talked for half an hour about the kids' growth and future plans. And Jack finally managed to swim 25 yards the other day. He just wants to swim every day now. And Dean's doing very well in school and his teacher praised him. I'm looking forward to their future. Lately, I've been thinking, thanks to your work, we have a good life. But when I think about them growing up fast, I want them to have a little more time with you during this sensitive period. Of course, I know it's difficult. I understand, but these couple of years are very important for my career. If the project succeeds soon, it will be easier for me to come back. I'll be able to spend more time with you guys then. Let's be strong for them. He encouraged me. After that, I gossiped a bit about mommy friends and asked him about his plan for the day. Soon I reached the limit of sleepiness. My parents, who had put the kids to bed and returned to the living room, also looked tired. I'm sorry, I'm exhausted now. I have an early start tomorrow, so I'm going to bed. I thought I had hung up the video call. My brain must have shut down already because I turned off only the camera and the speaker 
and the call itself was still connected. I must have looked to Ian as if the call had ended. I felt satisfied after having spent some quality time with him. Thank you guys for putting them to bed. Let's recharge our energy too. Good night. I was about to get up from my seat. Okay, one thing is done. Hello, I'm done with the family call. You can come over now. I heard Ian's happy voice calling someone. Huh? Still on the line? Apparently, someone was coming to his place. He mentioned earlier that he had to go to the project site later for an inspection. I wondered if it was someone from work. I had a bad feeling when I heard his overly sweet voice. The sleepiness that had made me feel as if I could sleep as a log earlier had vanished. I told myself that it was probably just a colleague picking him up. Hopefully, it was just unfounded anxiety and nothing was going to happen. Even though I thought so, I clicked on the record button on the screen. Ian had left the room to take a shower, and only the bed was in the view. My parents also seemed to be a little uncomfortable with the tone of his voice. He can't hear us now, can he? My mom asked in a hushed voice. The camera and microphone are off right now, so he can't. My dad warned me that it wasn't nice to peek into his privacy and that I should have turned it off. Just a little bit until he leaves for work. I want to see how he prepares for work, please. I persisted, and the three of us continued to watch the screen together. About 15 minutes later, the doorbell rang, and I heard Ian saying, Hold on, coming! I still didn't know what to expect. There was nothing wrong with taking a shower before going to work and having his colleague pick him up. I still couldn't help but feel uneasy and suspicious about his cheerful voice. I saw him get out of the shower and walk across the bedroom in his bathrobe. I thought to myself, Oh no, it's finally happening. He wouldn't wear a bathrobe when his colleague is picking him up, right? The closet is probably in his bedroom. My mom was anxiously talking to my dad and me. Then we heard a woman's voice in the distance. We saw her, probably in her 20s, with her hand wrapped around his waist, come into the screen. I wondered if happiness was something that could fall apart so suddenly. Thinking so, I stared at the screen with my parents. This is it, isn't it? It's unbelievable. I tried to come up with something better to say, but my throat felt tight and nothing else came out. I'm going to hunt him down. Otherwise, I won't be able to calm myself. I'm keeping quiet for now for the recording of important evidence, but I'm going to make sure he takes responsibility for this. My dad was furious. Ian was lying on the bed with the woman kissing and playing with her breasts on the screen. I felt like a fool, wondering what I was doing. I wish we could go on another trip. We spent quite a bit last time. Do you still have any money to spare? She asked while showing him the pictures of their trip on her phone. Don't worry, I've told the accounting guy to separate my paycheck stubs. My wife doesn't know how much I get paid. I also handle the family savings, so even if I spend a little, she won't know. He was very relaxed. While I was raising the kids here, he was enjoying a trip with his mistress. Moreover, as far as I heard, they went to a place I had repeatedly told him that I wanted to go. And then sure enough, they started doing the deed. I felt nauseated, but my parents and I watched them on the screen with blank expressions. My dad said, you don't have to watch all this. Go to bed now. It's harmful to your eyes. I'll have to see it as evidence later anyway, so let me just get it over with. I put on a brave face and replied nonchalantly. After they were done, and just as the mistress was about to leave, I quietly turned off the computer. It was already 3 a.m. We all must have been overwhelmed by mixed feelings, and I could see that my parents were exhausted. Guys, let's go to bed for now. We went back to our respective bedrooms, but I could not sleep at all. My body was too tired to move, but my brain was in a state of shock. My heart was beating 100 miles an hour. A sense of loss, a sense of despair, and an indescribable sense of closure overwhelmed me. 
I thought about what to do. I wondered if it could have been all a dream when I woke up in the morning. Who was that woman? So many thoughts were going around and round in my head. As I was fighting the sick feeling and trying to regulate my breathing, the morning came. What's wrong, Mom? You don't look well. My kids were worried. Sorry, I was talking to your dad until late and didn't sleep much last night. I made up a little lie. Your mom is tired today. Nana and I will drop you guys off. My parents took over my task for me. Get well soon, Mom. Let's go. The encouragement from the pure and kind kids almost brought tears to my eyes. I tried hard not to cry and send them off with a smile. I needed to get some sleep. I couldn't think straight. I drank a glass of water and went back to the bedroom. Ian was supposed to come back in two months. I had to prepare as much as I could before then and protect my kids no matter what. I swore to myself as I fell asleep. I must have been more exhausted than I thought. I slept until my kids came back. Mom, wake up! Grandpa wanted takeout today, so we got a pizza! Hurry, hurry! Jack woke me up, and I staggered into the dining room. Mommy, are you okay? Dean looked at me worried. Yes, I'm okay, thank you. I'm feeling much better seeing you boys. Did you have fun today? I tickled them, pretending to be cheerful. Stop it! No! They were relieved to see me looking joyful. Seeing them happily play around, my parents also looked a little relieved. You can't fight a war on an empty stomach. As I ate my pizza, I thought about the future. First, I told myself to find out who the woman was and then took a mental note to make an appointment with an attorney. There was no end to what I would have to do if I started thinking about custody, alimony, and so on. For the time being, I thought it would be best to consult an attorney. I didn't want to spread the rumors by consulting my friends. Fortunately, I was a housewife and had time during the day. After dinner, I put the kids to bed and called my parents into the living room. About yesterday, there's no point in dwelling on it. If I didn't have kids, I would have procrastinated. Strangely enough, when I thought about them, I became calm. I need your help. Then, without a pause, my dad said, Of course. While you were sleeping, I called an attorney I used to know. I know him from when one of my friends was cheated on by his wife, he said proudly. I was very grateful, but I knew it was nothing to be proud of. I turned to look at my mom. I will help you as much as I can. I trusted Ian so much, but he betrayed us. I wouldn't be satisfied if I didn't do anything. She readily agreed. I wasn't sure what she was planning, but she seemed to be enjoying the situation. I made an appointment with the attorney this weekend. Can you be there? My dad asked about my schedule, and my mom said, Don't worry, I'll watch the kids. The next day, we started rolling. We had two months until Ian's visit. We wanted to settle everything before then. First, I checked all the SNS. It was surprisingly easy to find out about his mistress. She worked for the same company as him. She was a secretary at an overseas branch. I went to his company and explained the situation to his local boss to get his help. His boss was at first puzzled, but as soon as I showed him the video of the infidelity, he held his head in his hands. I am very sorry. I will share the situation with my supervisor and take the appropriate action. Next, we discussed filing for divorce, alimony, and the necessary information with the attorney. The video evidence of his infidelity alone was conclusive, and I also had a copy of the bank statement and contact information of the mistress. It was almost perfect, so I was told not to worry. Of course, I had to report it to my parents-in-law. At first, they denied the accusation and said I was making it up to get alimony. But as soon as I showed them the video, they fell quiet and apologized to me frantically. We are so sorry. We will do everything we can to help you. The most painful part was explaining the situation to my kids. 
I honestly didn't know what to tell them. If I lied and told them that he couldn't come home for a long time because of work, they would grow up looking forward to visiting him without question. I didn't want to do that. I made up my mind and told them. Your dad lied to me in a very unforgivable way. I'm very hurt. I can't live with him anymore when he comes back. I'm sure you guys will miss him, but will you come and stay with me? They didn't seem to understand the gravity of the situation yet, but they said they wanted to be with me. I couldn't help but cry. I'm sorry. I'm very sorry. Then came the day Ian returned. I told him that I had reserved a private room at a restaurant to welcome him home with the family. I waited for him with my parents, my in-laws, and his boss. As soon as he arrived at the restaurant, is there anything you need to tell us? My father-in-law asked him, managing to suppress his anger. What's going on, boss? All of you? What's this all about? He was flabbergasted by the situation. There's no point in keeping a secret. All I need is your signature. I slammed the divorce papers, alimony charge, and a letter of termination from his company. He was stunned and frozen. And my in-laws started yelling at him. I told him to speak to my attorney and left the restaurant with my parents. After that, oh, I want to start over with you. It was wrong. I love only you with all my heart. His forgive me messages rolled in non-stop. So I told him to go through my attorney and blocked him. He staked out in front of my house a few times and tried to clear the path through my parents. He intentionally bumped into them and spoke to them in a strangely friendly manner. He tried various ways to get close to me, including talking to mutual acquaintances. Of course, I brushed them off. I called the police when he showed up at my house, and my parents completely ignored him. I told my friends the whole story and put the word out. He was completely isolated. I was told later that when I called the police, he got a little out of control. He was charged with assault and battery, and joined the National Criminal Database. On the day of the court hearing, he asked to see the children at least once a month. When I asked him how dare he come to see them, he shrunk and fell silent. He did have the right to see them, so if they asked to see him, he was allowed to do so with me present for a limited time. Since he came back, he had been having a pretty spectacular time. He lost his family. Was disowned by his parents, and was eventually laid off from his job. He was living on the edge, while working part-time jobs to pay alimony. The salary he lied about and the savings, which were used up in the end, were used against him to make up a considerable amount of alimony. He also broke up with his mistress. He couldn't afford to pay child support, so his parents were paying on his behalf as a way of apology to their grandchildren. He was seeing the kids in the beginning, but as they got to the age when they understood what had happened, the less often they asked to see him. From the day I found out about his affair to the day of divorce passed like a storm. It's a funny story now. To be honest, I don't have an ounce of sympathy or sadness for him anymore. No matter where he is or what he's going through. As for me, I invested the alimony in stocks and was very successful. I was able to send my kids to college without any difficulties. Now that my kids are independent, I bought a small house in the countryside and I'm enjoying a slow life by myself. What I enjoy most now is seeing my adorable grandchildren. Although it's not a convenient place like the city, with everything you need, it has a lot of nature, clean air, and a very pleasant community. I don't have a lot of reasons to go to the city, so I'm satisfied with this tranquil place. I have a family who loves me very much. My sons come to visit me with. Their families during the summer vacation. I spend my days thinking, I'll never want to give up this happiness. My husband threatens me with divorce paper every time we have a fight. I had enough. 
so I signed the papers and... You better think once if you think that it's okay for you to talk to me like that. If we get a divorce, then you'll be the one on the street, you parasite. My husband, Will, sneered at me as he said that. Apparently, my husband did not know how much I had contributed to our family. I was so angry that I filled out the divorce papers that he had shoved in my face right then and there. You finally signed the papers, huh? He says that as he smirks at me. Well, you better be proud of your victory while you still can. You'll be the one who gets hurt later, though. My name is Reese. I am 32 years old and I am a full-time housewife. It has been one year now since I got married to my husband, Will. One might think that after a year of marriage, one would still be enjoying being a newlywed, but that was not the case for me. My husband became a very strict, bossy husband as soon as we got married. My husband and I met at a blind date. I am a little ashamed to say that I entered the company where I worked for, having graduated from an all-girls college with little experience in love and having romantic relationships. And after becoming a company employee, I was so busy with work that I had no time for romance. When I realized that I had reached this age, I panicked a little and began to participate in blind dates. And that was where I first met Will. He was also an office worker at a company and he was two years older than me. Being of the same age, we had a great conversation and it was fun. He asked me for my contact information and after exchanging them, he asked me out on a date. It had been so long that I had forgotten how to go on a date, but he took the lead and we had a great time. After that, Will confessed his feelings for me, and we started to go out. Since we are at this age now, I want us to be together with marriage in mind. He had said that, and we proceeded with our relationship smoothly, with me being aware of the possibility of marrying him. We continued dating for about a year and then got married. I had never been in a relationship before and I think it is a miracle that I was able to get married. My friends around me kept saying to me, it would be perfect if only Reese could find someone good enough for her. And since I was the only one single out of my friend group, I was the one most surprised that I could finally get married. I was so happy to be congratulated by so many people at the wedding, including from my friends and my colleagues from work. I realized that getting married was a really happy thing. But now I think about it, the wedding was actually the peak of my happiness. After marriage, I quit my job and became a full-time housewife, as my husband had asked me to do before and since becoming a full-time housewife, I worked hard at doing the house chores properly every day, cooking and cleaning, and doing the laundry for my husband. But despite all the efforts, there was one thing which was just hopeless, and that was my husband's earnings. Although my husband had asked me to be a full-time housewife, he earned less than I had expected. We could manage to make ends meet and live together, but it was still difficult to be luxurious and it would be very difficult if we ever had a child. But my husband put a lot of pressure on me by saying, I'll do my best to earn money, so don't slack off on the house chores. I think I should really ask Will to have the company increase his income a little more or I should earn money doing a part-time job. But my husband seems to value that a wife should definitely be a housewife, and it seems difficult for me to tell him how I wanted to work. So I have been living off from my own savings when I go grocery shopping most of the time. Whenever I tried to cut back on the budget for food, my husband would immediately ask me, 
We don't have much dishes today. Why are you slacking off? So, like this, I have to cook a lot and serve a lot of dishes to satisfy my husband, which also costs me a lot of money since I had to get a lot of ingredients. When I add in the rent, utilities fee, and other expenses, my husband's salary leaves us with at most $100 each month. Because of this situation, I cannot even afford to buy my own clothes or cosmetics. Still, I had fallen in love with my husband and married him, so I wanted to make sure that our life as a married couple was good. But then, in the midst of all this, my husband complained to me. Hey, the money I can use this week isn't the amount a little too small? I mean, hundred dollars is really nothing. What? But... What do you mean, but? I'm gonna get a little more money from our shared account, okay? Uh... How much are you going to take then? Hmm... About three hundred dollars, I think. Uh, no. That's a little too much, don't you think? Excuse me? What the hell are you saying? If I say I'll take some money, I'll take some money here. But, but... Since Will was too clueless, I thought that I had to tell him this, so I said this to my husband boldly. With the amount of what you earn, Will, we can only have you take hundred dollars from our shared account. What? There's no way! Your way of controlling the family finances is, is clearly not good. But even if you say that, I can't have you take more than hundred dollars while you won't let me cut down the budget for our food. You really are a useless scumbag wife. Excuse me? When I had boldly argued against him to let him know of our current situation, he began to treat me horribly. If you go against me like that, then I'll divorce you. Huh? W why would you even say that you'll divorce me? It's because you won't obey me. Do you realize that if I leave you, you'll have no choice but to become homeless? So just obey and do as I tell you to. Bam, my husband forcibly took $300 out of our shared account and forced me to make ends meet with the rest of the money that we have. But when I cut back on the food budget, Will would make a scene and complain again, as usual. At this rate, we would not be able to make a living, and we would just lose more and more money. So, I made up my mind to get a second job. I'm actually really good with computers and machines, and I was an engineer when I previously worked at the company. I found a site where I could register and work as a freelance and receive requests to create web pages and help out with IT related services. I put my working experiences and other information so that I could get work. At first, the jobs were pretty cheap, but I was still happy to get them. Even if it was only 100 to 200 dollars, it would still be a lot of help. And it was kind of fun to be able to work for the first time in a while. From then on, I worked hard to get more and more jobs on my own. Then, as my performance increased, the unit price per case went up. I found myself earning about $500 a month about three months after I started the freelance work. With $500, I can afford a lot of things. Earning some money seemed to stabilize my mind with all the concerns I had, and I was able to spend my daily life more peacefully than before. But recently, my husband began to spend money really lavishly compared to before. He started buying expensive clothes and accessories. Hey, aren't you spending too much on your clothes and your accessories? I mean, how can you buy such things with the $300 that you have? I simply wondered how he was buying things, so I asked him. Then, my husband said something which shocked me. Oh, well, I withdrew money from our shared account and spent it, of course. What? You said you don't have any money, but you have it all saved really well. I quickly checked the bank book on the bank app of our shared account. 
Then it turned out that the money I had saved on the side had decreased by a lot. Oh no! Since you lied to me that we don't have much money, I'll reduce the amount of money I give you. Huh? And I'll be taking five hundred dollars per week for me to use it for the week. N no way! That's too much. How much more do I have to cut back? As you can imagine, I had reached my limit. I couldn't let my husband do whatever he wanted any longer. You should at least understand my hardships a little. I'm working so hard on your limited income, and I think you should at least be praising me and being grateful for it. When I said that, my husband's face turned red, and he got angry. You've got to be kidding me! You have some nerves to insult me, huh? Wow, you really pissed me off. Now I'll be taking seven hundred dollars a week. If you don't agree to it, I'll divorce you. Saying that, my husband took out some documents from a drawer. I beg your pardon. Why do you have these divorce papers? I prepared all this just to make you feel threatened. So if you ever go against me any more, I'll really divorce you. This is just completely unbelievable. How can Will be so arrogant and selfish like this? But unfortunately, at that time, I was still earning a small amount with my side job. If possible, I would like to raise my income a little more. Besides, now that my husband has taken the liberty of increasing the amount of money which he would take for the week. If I don't raise my own income, the cost of living will become really harsh. I worked harder than ever and tried to take on more work. But then one day, my income suddenly increased. I began to receive work from several clients on a daily basis with a higher price. I found myself earning about four thousand dollars per month. At this point, I didn't need a husband who was being very bossy and strict with me, even though he didn't make much money. Then, around that time, my husband began to pick on me again. You really don't have much variation in the dishes you make. You really are a useless, good-for-nothing wife. You're a full-time housewife, so why are you so bad at doing the house chores? You're not even pretty, and you're useless as a housekeeper. You're the worst. What do you mean, a housekeeper? Have you been looking at me like your housekeeper instead of your wife? Of course. I took in a dull, plain woman like you as my wife, so you better be grateful I even did that for you. Excuse me? I can't believe you. You really are the worst. You better think once if you think that it's okay for you to talk to me like that. While saying that, he took out the divorce papers and shoved it into my face. If we get a divorce, then you'll be the one on the street, you parasite. My husband Will sneered at me as he said that. Apparently, my husband did not know how much I had contributed to our family. I was so angry that I filled out the divorce papers that he had shoved in my face, right then and there. My husband was momentarily surprised, but seemed happy as he looked at the divorce papers I had signed. You finally signed the papers, huh? He says that as he smirks at me. When you're out on the streets being a homeless, I'll make sure that I'm going to film you on my phone. <laughs> Now pack up your stuff. And get the hell out of here. Well, you better be proud of your victory while you still can. You'll be the one who gets hurt later, though. I did as I was told, and I packed my bags and left home. And I immediately stayed at a hotel. My parents' house is in the countryside in another district, so after spending a night in a hotel, I went back to my parents' house. My parents were surprised that I had suddenly returned home. But they were furious when they heard what had happened. After relaxing a little at my parents' house, I decided to punish my husband for treating me so terribly. In fact, I had suspected something was fishy ever since my husband started to spend a lot of money on things. 
So I had asked a private investigator to look into my husband. And it turned out that my husband was having an affair behind my back with another woman. What's more, his mistress seemed to be the wife of the manager of the department where he worked at. So I sent a content certified letter to Will's company and also sent the department manager the photos and documents proving that Will and the manager's wife were having an affair. Soon after that, I received a phone call from my ex husband. Hey, what the hell did you do? What do you mean? You were sneaking around and doing bad things, so I only let the public know about it. You, you've got to be kidding me! Because of you, I have no position in the company now, and I'm already in a lot of trouble, you know? My ex husband's affair became quite a problem within the company. And first of all, he made the department manager very angry, which apparently made a really bad impression to the upper management about my ex husband. So, Will had a pay cut and was transferred to a regional office as a demotion in the end. It must be really difficult to take a pay cut when the salary is so low to begin with. I even think that being in freelance. Would be way better, and you can still earn much more than working at Will's job. Oh, yes, and of course, I'm going to ask for alimony from you as well. What the? How dare you? What the hell do you have against me that you'd go that far to make me suffer like this? What the hell are you saying, Will? Did you think that I wasn't angry at you for abusing me and saying all these horrible things at me? And then having an affair with another woman behind my back? Oh, don't you worry. You're going to hell. When I said that angrily, my ex husband suddenly sounded weak and sad. W wait. I'll change myself, so let's just start over. <laughs> What are you even talking about? How am I even going to benefit from that? N no, I have income. So if you get a part time job or something, we can both make ends meet. Well, that's too bad because I'm already earning $4,000 per month. Pardon? I make quite a lot as a freelance engineer, you know. All I need is a computer to work so I can go anywhere and have fun while I work. So, there is no need for me to remarry you. No, no way! My ex husband seemed really shocked to learn that I make significantly more money than he does. But it's none of my business anymore. Well, I have nothing I need to talk to you about anymore, so I'm hanging up now. Oh, hey, wait up! With that, I hung up the phone and blocked all incoming calls from Will. After that, I put a restraining order on Will to prevent him from coming over to my parents' house, and I moved to Thailand, which had been on my mind for a long time. Currently, I am living a comfortable life working from home while living in Thailand, where the cost of living is pretty low and reasonable. Since I've experienced enough with my love life, I think I will continue to enjoy my life on my own in Thailand. It's pretty lame that Will has a low income, even though he was the husband and he was acting all arrogant like that. And it's disgusting that he was also having an affair. A man like him really should go to hell, treating his own wife like that. Reese could have punished him a little more, don't you think? But whatever the case, I am glad that Reese had divorced Will and has a better life now. I hope Reese will continue to enjoy her life in Thailand and be happy. Thank you for watching until the end. Please subscribe to our channel. We hope to see you in our next video.